All right, so today we're uh, we're really getting into it, huh? Extremism, uh. radicalization, the whole the whole shebang. Yeah, it's it's heavy stuff and important, obviously, especially well, you know, with everything going on. Right, and the material you sent over, really fascinating stuff, especially uh, Picciolini. Yeah, his books, both of them. His, yeah. his insights are just incredible. I mean, to come from that world to be, you know. Yeah, a former white yeah. supremacist. Yeah. To then dedicate himself to helping others get out. I yeah. Mean, talk about a perspective shift. Exactly. And it's a perspective we desperately need, especially now. I mean, you see the headlines. Hate crimes are, you know, they're not going away, are they? It's terrifying. And what's so powerful about breaking hate, at least for me, is how Picciolini doesn't just, you know, lay out the problem. Yeah. He brings us these stories, these really personal stories of people who are drawn into this world. Yeah, like like Cassandra, right. Oh, man. Her story, it's it's heartbreaking. Here's this this teenage girl, spends a lot of time online, seems, you know, pretty typical. Totally. And that's the thing, right? It could be anyone. Exactly. But she ends up, like, deep in this world of white supremacy online. Yeah. And it makes you wonder, how does this happen? Well, that's where Picciolini's whole pothole concept comes in, right? The potholes. He argues that it's often these these personal struggles, you know, like feeling isolated or or dealing with trauma, things like that. They create these openings. Openings for what? For extremist groups to exploit. They see those vulnerabilities, those those cracks in the pavement and they just they just slither in. And for Cassandra, it seems like it was those feelings of isolation, maybe even some some jealousy towards her twin sister that created the the pothole, so to speak. And they offered her what she was craving, belonging, purpose, even if it was all built on this foundation of hate. It's it's scary how effective it can be. It really is. And you see that same pattern with, well, with a lot of the stories Picciolini tells. You've got Daniel, who, you know, dealt with so much racism and neglect growing up. Right. And then there's Ben, the veteran, struggling with PTSD. And Reggie, who is just like searching for some kind of purpose after a string of, you know, just bad luck. Each one, a pothole, a need. And these groups are, they're like predators, you know? They know exactly what to say, how to manipulate. And they're getting, like, scarily good at it. I mean, you read about how they're now targeting veterans specifically. Oh, yeah. They see them as, like, these prized recruits. I mean, think about it. The combat skills, the training. It's terrifying when you think about Ben. Yeah, his military experience, in a way, it made him more, I don't know, susceptible to the whole the whole us versus them mentality. Right. It's it's like it played right into their hands. And that's the thing, right? You could be so easy to write these people off as like, you know, monsters, mm -hmm. but they're not. Exactly. They're human beings. They have stories. And, and often they've just been manipulated and exploited. Which is why I think Picciolini's approach is so, so important. He doesn't just want to understand these individuals. He wants to like help them get out. Yeah, the disengagement part. It's huge. And he talks about this idea of like creating cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance. Yeah, it's basically about like gently challenging their worldview, yeah. exposing them to different perspectives, making them confront the, you know, the contradictions in their own beliefs. Like that story with Daniel, right? And Susan Bro. Oh, man. Talk about a powerful encounter. Meeting the mother. Uh, the woman he, you know, he hated. The woman who was killed in Charlottesville? Yeah. I can't even imagine. But that encounter, as heavy as it was, it seemed to really shake something loose in him, you know? It makes you wonder, what if? Exactly. It's it's remarkable, isn't it, to, to go through all of that and come out, I don't know, fighting for the other side, basically. Yeah. It really is. It speaks to, like, the power of, you know, turning your life around. And what struck me about his own story in White American Youth was just how, I don't know, normal his childhood seemed. Yeah, you'd never, like, looking back, you'd never guess he'd go down that path. Right. Loving parents, stable home, right. really challenges those assumptions about, you know, extremism only breeding in, like, broken homes or whatever. It's like a reminder that it can happen to, well, anyone, really. But for Picciolini, it seemed like music was a, like, a big part of how he got pulled in. Yeah, the music thing is, uh, it's fascinating, right? It's also, honestly, kind of terrifying how effective it can be. Like, these groups using music as a recruitment tool. It's like they're tapping into something, you know, primal, that yeah. need to belong, to be part of something. Exactly, and they just, like, twist it, package it with all this hate, it's insidious. He talks about, like, starting out with punk rock, which, I mean, I guess makes sense, and then going deeper and deeper into, like, the white power music scene. And it becomes this whole identity, right? A community. Yeah. 
which I mean, I guess we all crave that, right? Of course. So, but it's it's like they're building this this alternative reality, you know? Yeah. Where their hate is like the norm. And he tells this story, it just sent chills down my spine. He's like a teenager, and he almost shoots someone. Like it could have gone so wrong so easily. It's a good reminder that this isn't like theoretical, mm -hmm. you know? It has real world consequences. Definitely. But even within all that darkness, he has these moments, right? Where things start to shift for him. Like he gets married, he has kids, and you could almost feel this like this tension building within him. Right. Because he's experiencing like real love, the unconditional love of a parent. But he's holding on to all this, you know, this hate at the same time. It's like his world is expanding. And it's like putting pressure on those beliefs he built up. Cognitive dissonance in action. Right? Totally. But then it gets even more, I don't know, unexpected. He opens a record store. Right. Of all things. And it becomes this this turning point for him. because it, Suddenly, he's interacting with all these different kinds of people. People he's been taught to hate. Right. And it's like... He's forced to confront his own prejudices. Because they're no longer abstract, right? They're like yeah. real people standing right in front of him. And that, it seems like, is what really starts to break down those walls he built up. It's like proof that sometimes the real world can be more powerful than any propaganda. It's a powerful story. But things were about to get even more, uh, well, let's just say life had a way of, you know, challenging his commitment to change. In a big way it's, it's hard to fathom you know right. coming back from from that level of will hate and then to have this this tragedy on top of it all it really makes you question like how much can one person take yeah. but picciolini he he somehow finds the strength to not just survive but to to dedicate his life to helping others escape that same darkness it's kind of incredible when you think about it and reading both of these books breaking hate and white american youth it it really does feel like he's giving us this like this roadmap, you know? Oh, totally. And not just for, like, understanding extremism, but for actually doing something about it. Right. And one of the things that struck me, especially in Breaking Hate, is how how he goes beyond this, like, this simplistic good versus evil narrative. Because it's so much more complicated than that. Way more complicated. He's forcing us to, like, to confront this idea that extremism, it often preys on, like, on basic human need. The need to belong, to have a purpose, to feel like you're part of something bigger. Exactly. And it makes it, I don't know, it makes it harder to just dismiss these people as, like, as monsters. You know. Because they're not. They're human beings who have been, in many cases, manipulated and exploited. It's a tough pill to swallow, but it's it's the truth. And it's, I think, what makes Picciolini's work so, so vital. Because yeah. if we can understand those those potholes, those vulnerabilities, maybe we can actually start to prevent this from happening in the first place. A hundred percent. It's like instead of just reacting to the symptoms, we're addressing the root cause. Right. Like what if we focused on, I don't know, tackling social isolation? or economic inequality. Creating communities that are truly inclusive. Where everyone feels seen and heard and valued. It's a tall order. Oh, for sure. Yeah. But it's not impossible. And I think Picciolini's story and the stories he tells in these books, they offer like this glimmer of hope, you know? Yeah, that change is possible, even for those who seem like completely lost in it. And that, that human connection, genuine human connection, it has the power to, to break through even the darkest of ideologies. It's, it's a lot to process, that's for sure. A lot to think about. It really is. But I think I think it's a conversation worth having. So to everyone listening, thank you. Thank you for joining us on this uh, this deep dive. It's been, well, it's been real.